Hello, good evening, welcome to Business Live. My name is Daryl Kwao. Coming up tonight, Association of Oil Marketing Companies says reducing prices of petroleum products drastically as expected by consumers will not happen anytime soon. Ghana Export and Import Bank collaborates with some banks to facilitate lending to businesses in need of funding. Also tonight, non-performing loans reduced marginally to 6.3 billion cities ending December 2019. We'd look at the impact on cost of credit going forward. It's been 25 years of supporting your businesses. Thanks for being good company, as always. The Auditor General, Daniel Domelovo, has charged accountants to lead the fight against corruption through more diligent and transparent auditing of accounts. The Auditor General made the call uh, when he spoke with Joy Business on the sidelines of the 2020 induction ceremony of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana. According to him, accountability and transparency remain key in the fight against corruption in both the private and public sectors. According to a report by the United Nations Development Programme, corruption is costing Ghana's economy 13.5 billion cities annually. The menace also cost the global economy $3.6 billion, as some estimated to be about 5% of the global gross domestic product. According to the Auditor General Daniel Domelovo, accountants have a key role in curbing the corruption in both the public and the private sectors through the transparent and diligent audit of accounts. The antidotes of corruption include transparency and accountability. That is, people knowing how their money was used, what they use it for, who is the beneficiary, etc. And this is done by producing financial statements so to let or to inform the public. If this is not done professionally, if this is not done according to standards and is not done regularly, what happens is that people take advantage of non-existence of transparency and accountability and they use public funds. So when you produce this information and people are being held accountable, it deters other people from similar behaviors. And accountants are best place to do this. You have them in the districts, we have them in the ministries, we have them everywhere else. And even in the private sector, every government, every institution, private or government, have got an accountant. And if they're able to discharge their work professionally, I think it will help fight corruption, be it in the public sector or in the private sector. The Auditor General made a call when he spoke at the first 2020 induction ceremony at the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, in Accra. President of the Institute urged accountants to be guided by best practices to aid the fight against corruption. We have standards and regulations guiding the accounting profession. So in fighting corruption, all boil down to going or abiding the regulations we have in the accounting profession. If you go by the ethics, the standards, and in line with everything you do as an accountant, I think the corruption itself will come out. It's not something you are going to hunt for like hunters, but you go for an audit and you the principles of auditing any error or any fraud will come out by itself. And that's what we are urging all accountants to go by the standards of the profession, but not by their own imaginations. For Joy Business, Shilata Maklu reporting. Ghana's payment systems and corruption within the regulatory agencies remain the topmost challenge for both foreign and indigenous businesses across the country. This is an outcome of a survey conducted by the UK uh, Ghana Chamber of Commerce in the last quarter of 2019. The chamber says it is collaborating with the Ministry of Finance to correct some of the disruptions that are caused by tax officials from the Ghana Revenue Authority that 
have served as disincentive for investment growth. Here is Executive Director of the Chamber, Ajoba Chiama. It wasn't so much uh, not wanting to pay taxes, but it was so much more the frustrations with trying to be compliant. So as you heard one um, audience member say, you know, um, why do small or medium-sized businesses have to pay the same rates as um, the larger corporates? Um, why is it that the Ghana Revenue Authority uh, comes to them and audits and um, then applies interest and all of that is very inconvenient and very, very frustrating. So it's more to do with the processes of engaging with the Ghana Revenue Authority. As a chamber, what we do is that we provide an advocacy platform and so we are indeed engaging with the Ministry of Finance and the Ghana Revenue Authority. We have engaged with them since our establishment in 2016 and we'll continue to engage with them to put forward the views of our members and to ensure that we match uh, the concerns of our members with the um, solutions that they are proffering. Yes. Some of these things are also disruptions to your businesses. Apart from meeting with the government or the GRA itself, what other strategies are some of your members also, or you advocate for some of your members to take in order to avoid some of these things? Um, you know, um, obeying the law is very, very important. And our businesses are ethical businesses. They want to be compliant with the laws and regulations in this country. And therefore, this is why this is a good opportunity for them to flag some of the issues. Because, of course, in obeying the law, you don't um, want it to seem like you're doing it gradually. You know? But if you have a concern, you have to speak up. So that is what they are doing. Now, loans that banks fear would not be paid on time have reduced marginally. They came down by more than 5% to hit 6.3 billion CDs at the end of December 2019. Now, this is contained in the 2019 banking sector report. But what would be the implications of this on cost of credit going forward? Georgia Affair has more. The Bank of Ghana in the latest banking sector report attributed the decline to a combination of loan recoveries and write-offs. This development helped non-performing loans to go down. In terms of composition, the private sector accounted for more than 90% of the loan that was given out and the remaining going to the public sector. In terms of ratios, non-performing loans also declined from 18.2% to 13.9%. And in December 2000, the report may come across as good news for businesses that had in the past complained about access to credit. Now, this is because and improved non-performing loans could help deal with the credit delivery challenges in the country and also issues of access to credit as well. The Bank of Ghana in the report also noted that a strong pickup in credit was as a result of a reduction in loans that the banks fear would go bad. Now, if this trend should continue, as well as a stabilized economy, then the cost of credit could also reduce significantly in the coming month. The governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Arderson, recently noted that they will be working with the judiciary to look at how loan cases before the courts can be fast struck as well. All these, they believe, that could help reduce interest rates in the country. Now, the Ghana Export and Import Bank is collaborating with some banks to facilitate lending to businesses that need funding but may not have adequate collateral. CEO of the Ghana Exim Bank discussed this during a workshop on credit guarantees with some banks in Accra. There's more in this report. The Ghana Exim Bank is mandated to provide support for trade between Ghana and other countries, as well as facilitate credit to exporters through credit guarantee issuance. According to the CEO of the bank, Lawrence Ejinsam, it has in recent times also supported funding of 1D1F projects and other private sector businesses. Despite these interventions, the CEO noted that access to credits by businesses, especially SMEs, continue to remain a challenge. According to him, the Ghana Exim Bank will be collaborating with some selected banks to help the risk lending to small businesses. Exim Bank wants to collaborate with the banks. To be able to support them because if they don't have guarantee or collateral the banks will not approve the loans for them so what we are saying is that at the back of those customers we we'll more or less will provide a guarantee for them to be able to in that way 
a lot more of the SMEs will come into the fold of the having access to finance. The CEO disclosed this during a workshop with the selected banks. He explained that credit guarantee will be largely used to help the businesses with acquisition of equipment. Most of the monies go into purchase of equipment because we are not a country that produces these equipment. So if we're working with any of these exim banks across the world, then they are also exporting their services or products to us. So for instance, if you want to buy um, a hatchery or a processing of poultry machine from the US, this facility will then be used. And we will undertake to do the risk assessment and make sure we share that risk assessment with the US exim. When they approve, that will allow you to be able to purchase any equipment from the US. You pay 15% to us as down payment, and the US exam would then also guarantee to JP Morgan of the 85%. And it is this we want the banks to be aware so that they can apply to us or refer clients to us, or we can also refer clients to them. For Joy Business, Shleta Maklu reporting. Another story that is generating controversy, the Association of Oil Marketing Companies says reducing petroleum products drastically as expected by consumers will not happen. The National Petroleum Authority, MPA, has been pushing for a 15% reduction in prices, but the CEO of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, Kukwaj Mandria, says he will wish the regulator remains a, a, a voice price predictions. So far, members of the association say they have subsidized prices to the tune of 50 million cities and cannot continue to make losses. We understand the, what they, they, they expect that it also goes down. And you see it's going down. But it cannot be that drastic. So the going down is like sharing. The system when it's going up also share. Because going down, what it means is that we need to recover some of the losses we have made. And I say it varies from one OMC to the other, depending on the volumes they lift and depending on how, how much losses they, they made. You know, so giving even the same price. So it varies. So you could see that if you go to the market space right now, you see some of them have reduced very well. Some of them also are in the process of doing that. The next window ends, uh, this window ends 16th. So the next window, you see people responding. But what we are saying is that it cannot be as drastic as people expect. If this trend continues, the market dynamics will make sure that there's a conformity to the price reduction, which we will see the quantum coming up. But you know, if you don't take a, tomorrow when the price goes up, what are you going to do? So that's why sometimes if you watch the price, at some point it stabilizes. Even though the world price might be going up, we don't even increase it. We just stay where we are. Talking about MPA, 15%. I wish you can ask the MPA boss. You know, you know there are some parameters here which are controlled by the government, the taxes and levies. And this under the purview of it's being supervised by MPA. Probably he knows what he's saying. If those levies and taxes are something which is going to go down, probably we can also go down. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But we feel that we have suffered enough. So now this is the time we also have to recover. So let's get a reaction to that from the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Ghana. We have on the phone line the Executive Secretary, Duncan Amwa. Thanks for your time uh, tonight. Uh, so you heard the OMCs that they are not willing to reduce the prices of petroleum products. They cite uh, many reasons, amongst them the fact that they've had to subsidize fuel to the tune of 50 million uh, I'm not too sure whether it was dollars or cities uh, as of December last year. What's your reaction to that? Um, I would have wished I could listen to the entire stretch of the interview by Mr. Ajimendria at the press conference. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't hear everything. Uh, what I, however, from my checks uh, with uh, the association is that they are not suggesting they wouldn't go down on fuel prices. Uh, what I got from the little I have heard from the association so far is to the extent that 
uh, they are going to go down, but it might not reflect what the NPA had initially put out there at 15%. Initially, I had also had issues with the NPA's figure of 15 We had given a range. Anything between 10 and 30% will be happy. Unfortunately, once the regulator says 15 then you have a situation every Ghanaian would, from Monday, start looking at the pumps and looking to see where prices were and whether we have 15 percent because that is the regulator i do have a very strong understanding that most of the omcs would indeed go down but it might not be as huge as it, it might not be huge. it might not be as, as it might not be as huge as we expect it might, it might not be as soon as we want to as he was explaining they they have to make up for some losses they encountered uh, sometime last year you see, what I'm trying to get at is this. They are still going to go down. Prices would be reviewed downward. Now, because it's a deregulated market, some have already taken hit a lot of, you know, differences between what they had been selling and what they should have been selling for. Now, this is a situation where you have the regulator given a certain raw figure, that says 15%. If the expectation is not diffused, what happens now is that if somebody even did 13% on Monday, we would go after the person. If somebody did 8 or 12 or 20%, we would say this is not what the regulator had indicated. And so I would rather want to hasten and wait till the second window commences Monday. We will do a quick market scan, check our prices, and see how much they were able to review for. Subsequent to which, we are going to still push and say, look, if there are other reductions that we deserve, do your boardroom meetings, do your math, and let us have it. But for anyone to say a flat 15 in a deregulated market, that mm -hmm. would be quite problematic. But again, let me reiterate: Prices are going to go down effective the second window uh, this month, which is uh, from Monday onward. But I cannot put a, think, a figure directly to whether we will get the 10 that we had initially requested or we'll get 20 or we'll get 30 or we'll get 7 or we'll get 6. But whatever it is, I'm not sure it's going to be the usual 1, 2% or 0.5%. It's going to be some reduction that you can put a finger to. But All right. as to discussing real figures at this point, I think the NPA would also uh, need to hasten slowly so that we await the market figures, and then mm. we can take the discussion from there. Uh, yes, because uh, I get the sense that uh, generally consumers expect some sort of um, action taken as we have seen uh, oil prices go down. Is that fair that a consumer is seeking uh, some sort of a reduction as soon as possible? Uh, indeed. We have had a position that says if it goes up, it goes up. When it comes down, it must come down. So we would need to see those reductions. But again, you also work within a certain legal framework that says once you have pricing windows, two pricing windows within a month, uh, it would only be fair to expect that any price changes or effectual prices would reflect at these forms within those windows. Mm. Where you have crossed a week already into a window, then it might be fair to say, just hang on a bit, let's get into the next window and see what the numbers say at the market. At that point, we can probably be able to do the math, the analysis thereafter, and say that this is what we should have gotten, maybe the first, second window, this is what we right. are getting now. But whatever be the case, I think Monday, Tuesday will be an interesting time to watch these forms and see how best uh, we can discuss fairness or otherwise from the various oil marketing companies. All right, thanks very much indeed, uh, Duncan Amwa, the Executive Secretary of uh, uh, Chamber of Petroleum Consumers. Uh, we would wait and see uh, for how long uh, these oil prices are going to go down and what um, sort of actions the OMCs are going to take uh, as they are being pressured by the MPA to reduce uh, prices drastically. Now. In 2019, Emirates operated 3,500 flights a week. That translates into 186,000 flights the whole year, traveling more than 885 million kilometers around the globe. 
That is a lot of flying hours for the Dubai-based airline, which operates the largest fleet of both Airbus and Boeing aircraft in the world, with one A319 as an executive jet. Now, during my recent trip to Dubai, I had the opportunity of visiting Emirates Engineering, one of the world's most technologically advanced aircraft maintenance facilities. The $350 million facility at the Dubai International Airport was opened in 2006. To date, it has 255 aircraft in service, 12 hangars, and has conducted over 1,000 sea checks. The sea check is performed every 20 to 24 months or as specified by the manufacturer. This maintenance check is much more extensive than the B check requiring a large majority of the aircraft's components to be inspected. Maintenance, repair and overhaul are very crucial in ensuring aircraft are in safe condition to fly. While some airlines outsource these services, Emirates has invested in this facility to maintain its growing air fleet. Each hangar, I'm told, has an entrance gate 88 meters wide and every bay can accommodate any size of aircraft with an engine thrust of up to 150,000 pounds. This includes the Airbus A380, which is 73 meters long, with an 80-meter wingspan and a tail 24 meters high. It was fascinating to see one of the Boeing 777s undergoing maintenance. The aircraft was undergoing a sea check. It had been stripped back to the steel structure and seating and interior finishing taken out and it appeared it was being assembled all over again. It can take barely a month to complete maintenance work. When the seating and interior finishing are taken out, they are sent to the workshop to be redone. We head to the next hangar where new seats for the massive A380 were being installed from economy to first class. So much investment goes into making the aircraft look brand new. Engineers are all being trained on uh, type rating, uh, type rating for uh, the type of aircraft that we have, uh, Airbus 380 as well as Boeing 777, and on their engines as well. They're all type rated. Technician would be also, uh, they have been also trained on uh, kind of a familiarization course because they don't certify it. The certification part is done only by engineers. And beside that, there'll be a human factor and all the safety training and all the same. Evacuation and complete training that have been uh, set up for all engineers. After passing through the engine shop, our last stop was Aircraft Appearance Center, where the exterior of the aircraft is assessed. Painting usually takes about two weeks to complete and 17 hours for drying. To dry, uh, obviously, again, different paint manufacturers have different things, but this one here, if we put the when we put the white on, it takes it 17 hours to dry. So when you put the white on, it takes 17 hours. You put your co the colours can be sort of like four to eight hours, the gold and that lot, and then the clear coats another 17 hours. But because it's a big aircraft, and you're doing the wings, which is a different colour to the white, you can do that, let that dry, and you can work other areas. So it's not as if to say. It, you paint it and then you go home. There's, there's, always, there's always another process to carry out during it. So it's, yeah. The makeover ILN involves preparing the aircraft, masking certain areas to protect them from paint, stripping the existing paint and sanding all the external surfaces before finally starting to repaint it. The A380 is painted after every seven to eight years. Emirates is rated among the safest airlines in the world and it makes much more sense having seen how much work goes into maintenance of its fleet. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, you might be fed up with the sight of plastic waste heaped at several parts of a craft choking drains. Well, for 24-year-old Adiza, this a pleasure passion to solve a social problem led her to create an agenda to recycle plastic bottles as building materials. Karin Dodu reports. Adiza Mohammed is on a mission to collect one million plastic bottles by April to build a three classroom block for a basic school in the Volta region. After several research works, she was inspired by similar projects in Tanzania and Kenya. So we are trying to address two issues which are 
reducing waste plastics and also reducing schools and the trees. That's why we are doing this project. Well, I went for a program some time ago and then I met some few friends from Tanzania and Kenya. So during our interactions, there's one particular person who uses plastic to build like he's into construction business, he uses it to build. So I thought it's wise. Why don't we also use the same plastic to create opportunities for those and like those that are less privileged? So that was why we started it. The technology of building with plastic bottles is not only eco-friendly but also cost-effective, as the plastic bottles will constitute about 40% of building materials. With the help of her friends, she has managed to collect about 8,000 bottles. But that is just a drop in the ocean, as statistics by the United Nations Environmental Programme shows that about 12 million tons of plastic enters the ocean annually, with Ghana contributing 1.7 million to the total figure. For now, Adiza goes around collecting mineral water bottles at gatherings and events. She also depends on donations from individuals. Our target is 1 million bottles and then we want to build a three classroom block for some people in a school in Volta region. So that's it. So if people have bottles and they want to support us, they should just call our numbers 0240158662 or follow us on all social media. Social is dry foundation. Yes. Although the Ghanaian government is making efforts to fight plastic waste with the establishment of an integrated recycling and compost plant, there still remains much to be done as the use of plastics in society grows by the day. For Joy Business, Karen Dodu. And that's our program tonight. Thanks for watching. There's more news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. We've got the day's latest stories over there, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. My name is Daryl Kwa. Thanks for watching. We are back same time tomorrow.